Hello, my dear friends. Big love to you all and hope and strength and energy and passion in these completely insane times. I cannot think of anyone I enjoy spending time in the heart more than with my great friend and mentor in so many ways, Matthew Fox. All of you must know something of this extraordinary man. And he has been a source of the deepest inspiration to me ever since I first met him, which is now 30 years ago. And both of us at this time are responding to the horrors and rigors of this time by really inviting in our different ways people to do much more profound spiritual practice. Matthew is laying out a magnificent set of monthly, daily meditations, which he will be talking about. And I am launching on February the 17th, a 40 days, 40 nights journey of profound soul prayer to help us all use the Lenten period to prepare ourselves for the great outburst of resurrecting joy that comes at Easter. And these prayers are taken from all of the universal mystical traditions. They're not just for Christians alone, they're an invitation for all spiritual beings to do the work in prayer to fashion a new being to meet the challenges of our time. And I thought that I'd begin our time together, Matthew, and thank you so much for doing this with me. And thank you for your glorious meditations every day. I thought I'd begin this time together by reading one of Kabir's great poems about the power of prayer in a brutal time. All times, of course, are brutal, but as we both know, this is an especially intransigently brutal time. So here is Kabir, and this is for you, Matli. The world's ablaze in illusion and desire. The trap of Maya is terrifyingly strong. Only the being who has won the sword of discernment can hack herself free. Take the name of God, my friend, as the boat to cross this brutal ocean. Without it, you'll never reach the other shore. Attaining the name is hard and rare, but I have no need for any other power. From beginning to end and age to age, the name of God binds me directly to God. And I'd love to just, as we resonate with that absolutely fierce and no holds barred poem that is so characteristic of one of our two great universal mystical poets, Kabir, the other one being Rumi, I believe. I would love to begin by asking you where do you think we are as a human race and of course as americans and why at this time is practice along the lines that you're offering and along the lines that i'm offering so essential and so important well first of all thank you for inviting me and uh, saying the nice things you said about me and I can say ditto to you that you've been an important friend an important ally in my journey for sure and I love your expansiveness and of course your interest in and knowledge of what I call deep ecumenism or drawing from the wisdom of all the world traditions because I feel when you go deep enough in any one tradition you come to this what I call the underground river uh, of wisdom and of divinity. So um, I really appreciate the work you've done, not only as a mystic and a passionate preacher, but as a scholar and um, and someone who walks your talk. So our, our, our appreciation for one another is, uh, is mutual. <clears throat> well, there's no question, like Kabir uh, 
is named something very powerful and you have that we're living in fierce times and um fierce times require a deepening we all have to deepen ourselves <clears throat> a deepening search for truth for discernment as as kabir says and we have to cut through the illusions both personal our own illusions and um cultural and there are plenty of those floating around so it's a time for truth isn't it and that's part of a uh, <clears throat> spiritual practice is to is to unpeel the layers of persona of personhood of of um, the false self to get to the deeper self the truer self and um where of course divinity dwells and where truth dwells and it's interesting that kabir in that poem is is um promoting uh finding the, the right name for god if you will the appropriate name for god and there are many names for God, but I think truth is one of them. Gandhi said that truth is his favorite name for God. And, um, and that is his religion, is God as truth. And um, there's a lot of <laughs> untruth, to put it mildly, of disinformation. We've even come, come up with a new word for it in our culture at this time. There's, there's piles and piles of disinformation that are being sold and bought and all the rest. So the search for truth, I think, is 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 certainly part of the uh, prayer process, isn't it? Um, but I mean, there are other names for God: um, beauty, and goodness, and love, and um, energy. And wow. I mean, there's so many, but all of them speak to us because they're calling from below. They're calling from our depths, and um, uh, that's I think what prayer is ultimately: is it getting down to our roots. <clears throat> I define prayer as a radical response to life. But the word radical is so interesting because it's the same as radix or root. So getting deep, getting to our roots as a species, our roots as individuals, as um, members of our community. What are the roots of being an American, for example? And, and, um, um, and what are the roots of being a male at this time in history? The roots of being a female. And whatever groups they belong to, the roots of being Jewish, the roots of being black, the roots of being um, Caucasian or Christian um, or Buddhist and Eastern. Um, and, and journeying into other arenas of depth and roots. I mean, one reason I love your Kabir, your daily Kabir, which I enjoy every day, is um, I want to hear the wisdom from other traditions. I don't want to just sit, uh, you know, en ensconced in my own tradition. I like to see, are, are there common truths here? Is, is wisdom truly uh, in international and universal? Um, and uh, then if it is, then Buddha's truth will speak to me and Kabir's truth will speak to me and Muslim truth will speak to me, the Sufi truth too, and, and Jewish truth for sure, and so forth. So, um, yeah, the, the search for truth in a time of lies, disinformation, and, and um, uh, ratcheted up desire, which is, uh, I think, built into the capitalist project, actually, to whip up desire so you'll keep the economic system going. I think all this is, is uh, asking for critique at this time. When I rang you to ask you to do this, we had a marvelous hour-long conversation in which we really laid out together our mutual and mutually coherent vision of how the world is now in very extreme danger from all kinds of crises that are coming together and how especially America is facing its moment of destiny in which it will have to be able to choose with all of its passion democracy or lose democracy to what is now clearly an emergent fascism. And one of the things that you said that struck me so passionately was that it's really time to face evil without illusion and to face that there are many dark forces operating in our culture at lethal levels of effectiveness that really do make it possible 
for a monstrous kind of fascism, more dangerous even potentially than German Nazism, to be born in this land that was consecrated by the noble dream of the constitution. And you let that hang in the air and I completely agree with you. And then you said something that I've been thinking about very deeply. You said that for you, the opposite of evil is not goodness. It's living a sacred life, living consciously inspired and empowered by a radical, naked, direct connection with sacredness. And I think it's to establish that radical, naked, direct connection with sacredness that you have evolved this year long meditation every morning and I am evolving these prayer classes. Can you speak to me of what really inspired you to lay down this journey that you fuel every day with new meditations, new thoughts? And I think you're at the moment dedicating a whole month to your stunning new book, which I've just reread for the fourth time <laughs> on Julian of Norwich. Why is it so important to you at this moment when you are working so hard on so many projects to pour yourself into this one? Well, <clears throat> some people asked me to, to write daily meditations uh, about two years ago when I started to do so on, on Mother's Day is when we launched it because Gaia, our mother, is in such trouble today. And... Um, and I just felt that it was time to kind of coalesce to focus around the suffering of Mother Earth, because that's the cause of so much other suffering. Uh, the coronavirus is born of the uh, disappearing biodiversity of our planet. And so um, that's the cause behind coronavirus. So why wouldn't we want to focus on the cause of coronavirus as well as on immediate um, uh, solutions or, or medicine? But... Um, yeah, I just felt that others others were doing daily meditations, and I think that's a good idea. But I just felt at this time in my life, why not draw on some of my previous writings and, and put them together in light of today's crises, and as you say, the fierceness of our time. But this, this point I make about the opposite of evil is not the good, because the opposite of good is the bad, uh, but the opposite of evil is the sacred. I think that's so important to realize because the sacred is the arena uh, that is really um, bigger than the, than the good. The good is wrapped up in it, but it's kind of like Rumi's poem, which of course you know well about uh, uh, beyond good and evil, there is a field, I will meet you there. It's such a beautiful poem. And it takes us out of the realm of moralizing, which is easy to do. Uh, Spiritual is much more than moralizing. It requires morality, but morality is not the last word. It is this meeting that is the last word in the field where the divine and the human meet and, and the, the sacred and nature meet. Uh, that's where we want to meet. And um, so I have nothing against the good <laughs> or talking about the bad. But um, I think these other two words, evil and sacred, are bigger words. It's like a lesson I learned from um, Buck Goldstorff, a Lakota teacher years ago who, who uh, worked in my school. We were friends and became good friends. And he said to me one day in our tradition, fear is the door in the heart that lets evil spirits in. Now that's so interesting that fear is the door in the heart that lets evil spirits in. So fear is, is a bad thing most of the time. Uh, it, it can be very dangerous, obviously, but there's even something bigger, and that's the spirit, the evil spirits that come in with it, that, that come in on his coattails. And so um, for me, this is a marvelous way of talking about, well, the chakras, really, and about how when, when we don't pay attention to the chakras to really build up our capacity for love and compassion, the fourth chakra, for example, that so when the fourth chakra is flabby or weak or or unbalanced, then not only uh, will fear come in, but other evil spirits will come in. Because I ask the question, why is it that racism and sexism and militarism and, and power over domination, all those realities 
they keep coming back every generation. You know, a previous generation, say Dr. King, yes, he stood up to racism, but it has to be done differently in the year 2021. And so what that means to me is the forces we're up against are spiritual forces, just like Paul said, powers and principalities. And that's just what Mark Goldstress was saying, that we're in the realm of spirit when you're dealing with real evil. And, and the bad acts and bad decisions are the door that let in these evil spirits. And I think just to talk about that is to put the whole conversation of evil into a, a fuller a context. And, and it also brings it back to your immediate first question, which is how do we prepare for this? How do we do, how do we do battle? How do we develop that spiritual warriorhood in all of us so that we go, do not get overtaken by the, by the demons of our time, such as pessimism, cynicism, despair, and all that. Because that goes along with living in a fierce time. You know, Julian said in her time, living through the worst pandemic in Western history, that, um, that the, the two worst um, uh, problems in her day were acedia and despair. And then I, I've been thinking about that for quite a while. And I said, oh, that makes sense. You know, when there's a pandemic, when people don't see a way out, and of course they had no science and no promise of that vaccine or anything, you don't see a way out. Then this world of despair and this world of acedia, which is a, is, is a lack of energy, uh, to begin new things, um, it's depression and it's addiction to television or anything else. Um, you can see it kind of swelling up these these um, invitations to to become cynical and to give up in one way or another. So I think she really onto something. And um, uh, so this is where the sacred steps up. Uh, the sacred for me is kind of a gathering of beauty and goodness and awe and that was transcends of those things as well the great mystery and passionate hunger to be one with the mystery yes because i think that is so important as part of what belongs to us it's rumi said that the most brave thing that you can do in your life is to let out your passionate longing for god hmm. and that's what the meditations that you give and the prayers that I'm offering are constantly working with to help people recognize this immense longing and give it a focus so that through that connection with the great passion force, the great joy force, the great peace force of God, we can be fed passion and peace and joy and, of course, compassion and wisdom. It's a relationship that enables us to be empowered at levels that nothing in our secular world gives us access to, isn't it? Mm. Yes, I'm so mentioned, glad you mentioned the word wisdom because I think that's really, for me, that's kind of the basket <laughs> that holds all this. And I think it also helps name the struggle between patriarchy and liberation because wisdom is feminine. She's feminine in the Bible. She's feminine around the world. Quan, Yin is right over my right shoulder here. Um, and, and our patriarchal culture banishes wisdom. Indeed, our entire educational system in the West, I believe, is oriented today toward knowledge. Now, knowledge is <coughs> very useful and very important, <coughs> and it, it can bring you things like vaccines and so forth, but it does not tell you why. Excuse me, my phone is interfering. Um, it does not... Uh, tell you why it's important that we put certain values forward. And um, so the banishment of wisdom, I think, is at the heart of this crisis that we're undergoing. And um, now I'm going to apologize. I'm going to do something my phone so this doesn't happen again. <laughs> I apologize. Didn't think of this before we started talking. <laughs> But uh, uh, you weren't, you were an unwise virgin, not a wise virgin. <laughs> Yeah, let me see now. I think wisdom, too, is important for another very complex but very rich reason, which I'll try and unveil for you and ask for your commentary on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have trouble dealing with technology when you're talking about important things. So. <laughs>
That's what no one calls. Okay. Yes. Keep going. I to be protected that you're protected from such technological ravages. <laughs> conversation. Look, when Jesus sends the disciples out into the world, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And then he says, he gives the really most extraordinary of all instructions for me in the gospel. He said, what you are required to do is to marry at the greatest depth in yourself, the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the dove. And at the deepest level, what Jesus is instructing his disciples to do is to face without illusion, the horror, the greed, the stupidity, the vulgarity, the cruelty of the shadow, the wisdom of the serpent, the deep, dark wisdom of the darkness in God, the darkness in human nature, the darkness in all of us, so that they can come to understand all the ways in which the dark forces find room in us through fear, through lust for power, through hunger to dominate nature, all the various structures of cold evil that patriarchy has perfected. On the other hand, asking them to pay just as much attention at every moment to the voice of the dove with its visionary promise of redemption, of transfiguration, of history being guided by an invisible mystery of love and of revelation. And the only force that can hold together these extreme opposites, which in our time I would characterize in a special way as being on the one hand, the possibility of extinction through patriarchy, and on the other hand, the possibility of rebirth and even transfiguration and evolutionary mutation through deep divine practice and through going through this dark night so that we can be born into our divine humanity, those two extreme opposites, the only way in which they can be held is in the embrace of Sophia, in the embrace of a wisdom <laughs> that understands the sacredness of both, in a sense, the power of both, and unites the deepest insights and intelligence of both to engender a lover, warrior, midwife of the new, a true disciple of the light in action. So for me, what your meditations are doing are in the deepest sense building our wisdom capacity to hold these extreme opposites and invoking the grace of contemplation of deep Lectio Divina, of deep, deep integration of the messages of the great mystics you've studied and the great mystic you are yourself, putting them into the depths of ourselves so that we can expand vastly enough to be able to hold these opposites, marry these opposites, and be birthed by that marriage into another level of evolutionary clarity and passion and focus and service. And for me, what prayer does is, as well as expanding wisdom, it unites that expansion of wisdom to an expansion born of intense devotion, of love, of deep, rich, abandoned, surrendered, ecstatic and sober love. And that when you bring wisdom and love together in that expansive consciousness, you not only can hold these two extreme opposites, but you can be born into an, being an ever cannier warrior for the new. And I wonder how that sits with you, that particular unfolding. Well, I think it's very rich. Um, I'm reminded of what Thomas Berry says, that we have to reinvent the human. And that um, this is a moment we're in in history. Because clearly, as you say, the, the path we're on is, <clears throat> is toward extinction. It's leading to extinction. And not only our extinction, but that of so many other species, one million of which have, have disappeared in our lifetime. So, um, uh, you know, from that point of view, it's, 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 it's a requirement. Uh, 
it's a sine qua non for survival. Uh, and you would think that most humans would have survival as a, as a value, as a goal. But again, <clears throat> I think this is where wisdom comes in. Now, you um, read a wonderful poem from Kavir. I just happened today to be typing up this poem from the Book of Wisdom oh. uh, for one of my for my daily meditation in a day or two. I like to share it because one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And we now know, by the way, that the historical Jesus fed from this very tradition, the wisdom tradition. So here's this. I just love this passage. It's from uh, Book Seven. Simply, I learned about wisdom. Now that's interesting. The word simple, you know. But it's not the same as going to school and getting a PhD, unfortunately. <laughs> I think we'll agree on that. <laughs> Simply, I learned about wisdom. The design of the universe. Notice, right off the bat, it's about cosmology. It's about seeing the whole. The force of its elements. Beginning and end of time. Changes in the sun's course. Variation of seasons. Cycles of years. Positions of stars. Now, to me, this is pure cosmology. Time, space, the sky, history, the design. all of it. Changes the sun's course, variation, cycles, stars, natures of animals. Now we're getting down to earth. Okay. Tempers of beasts, more animals, powers of winds, thoughts of humanity. I just love how late the thoughts of humanity get on board here. I mean, this is that, that different from the new creation story from science, from the new cosmology, that humans, we come af long after the animals, you know, and the stars, and the sun, and time itself, and the forces, the elements of the universe. So all these, you might say they serve us, they've, they've brought us here, but they precede us. I mean, notice these animals that we're willy-nilly, it seems, willing to, to make go extinct, I'm thinking of tigers and elephants and polar bears and whales and thought they were here 50 million years longer than we've been here but then it goes on thoughts of humanity uses of plants now it's so interesting to me it goes from thoughts of humanity right into the our intelligence to discover the use of plants and we use plants for so many things for their beauty for their food for medicines i mean all this and you know our ancestors discovered so many medicines in the plants and uh, and and we've inherited that the virtues of roots such things as are hidden, I learned for wisdom. The artisan of all taught me. I just love that. Wisdom is the artisan of all. And that's, Aquinas says often, God is the artist of artists. So wisdom is an artisan and God is an artist. And, and this is what it means to be an image of, of God. So what you talk about, the expansion of wisdom. Again, I just, um, I just find that passage to be, to be delicious. I it's that expansion of wisdom that initiates us into the sacredness of the entire creation, the design of that sacredness, and eventually it initiates us into the deep meaning of the crisis that we are now exploded into. Because if you can keep your wisdom eyes open calmly through contemplation and through prayer, what you will be shown is that, yes, there is a global dark night of the species, as you call it, and I call it a global dark night going on of unbelievable horror and severity. But even and especially perhaps in the middle of this appalling global dark night, the signs of the evolutionary design of a new embodied divine humanity are also appearing. And it's knowing that through direct revelation, through wisdom, through contemplation and prayer and sustained contemplation and sustained prayer that give you the calm, the steadiness, the passion, the energy, the focus to keep on being one of the humble midwives of the birth, even as the death seems so overwhelmingly powerful. In fact, more powerful, but that itself is an illusion that wisdom can help you correct because it takes the long view, the perspectival view, the view of what Joanna Macy calls deep time. And that is essential for 
all sacred activists now, for all true seekers now, for all people who know that democracy is in peril and fascism could be born, because it's that perspective and understanding that gives courage. <clears throat> yes, and courage, a big heart, courage, a big heart. You know, what grows the heart? And um, Aquinas says joy grows the heart. And, um, and um, as you say, caring and love, and passion grows the heart. And fear shrinks the heart. And self-centeredness shrinks the heart. So the, the opening up to the wisdom and the joy of different ways to pray, of other traditions, um, and the beauty that's to be found all around us in nature and in human nature are marvelous accomplishments of music and poetry and ritual and, and color and languages and song and music. Um, I mean, there's just so many ways in which humanity itself is, is, is blessed with wisdom and has been trying to find it and share it for as long as we've been around. Um, you know, how far back does the drum go? How far back does the flute go? You know, our efforts to, to, um, to speak praise, yes, to, to, to uh, sing praise. And um, as Rabbi Hester says, praise precedes faith. That it's the praise of our being here that should be the, the table that draws all of us together in our diversity. Um, to, to celebrate and to give thanks. And, and it's you out of that gratitude. What Hopis gave us at the end of the 1990s. The Hopi said, a terrible river is coming and many are going to be flooded and taken away by it. Mm -hmm. But this is a time of celebration. Mm -hmm. Because you, as you said about evil, the antidote and opposite antidote to and opposite of evil is the sacred mm -hmm. and the and opposite of and the antidote to the violence cruelty madness and fascist danger is celebration mm -hmm. from the deepest levels of ourselves mm -hmm. and all of the meditations that i've read in your series and all of the prayers that i'm offering in mine are ways either of celebrating nakedly and directly or clearing away everything in us that prevents us recognizing our unity with the creation and so pouring out our hearts and minds and actions in celebration of it. Mm. You say in your book on Julian something that moved me very much. You say that Julian says that prayer is oneing with God. And I know she coined that word. And I would love to know two things. What does Julian mean at the deepest level when she says prayer is oneing with God? And how do you pray? How mm -hmm. has your own experience of prayer shaken you and evolved you and inspired you and kept you so creative and vibrant you're 80 and you've never been pouring out yourself more than you are now so what's the secret Matt <laughs> well I think uh, Julian's word of course Julian was the first woman writer in English so she she coined a lot of language for us and uh for example the word enjoy she she created that word wow I didn't know in English that. yeah she made it the word enjoy it's from a French word that means to rejoice but she she made it an English word. She created the word. Um, and the word wanting is her word too. And she uses it as a noun, the one, this wanting, and as a verb to one and to be one to God. And you're right. Uh, she talks about prayer as a wanting. Prayer unites us to, to divinity. But I think uh, it's very parallel in other um, mystics. I think it's what Eckhart meant by breakthrough. And of course, Eckhart came a generation before Julian, but he invented a word in German. These creation mystics were inventing languages all over the place. <laughs> there wouldn't be an Italian language without Dante and Francis 
and and there wouldn't be the German language we know. I don't think without Eckhart, and or English without Julian. But um, and this just shows, you know, mystics have experiences we all do that are beyond words, and beyond the current language. So you got to come up with something to do. And now music is good and dance is good, but if you're going to use language, you often have to dig up, new, create new language to really spell it out or share it, to communicate it, and so. What Eckhart says about breakthrough, which I think is absolutely parallel to wanting by Julian, is this. He says, in breakthrough, I learn that God and I are one. Mm. So, I mean, that leads right into Julian saying wanting, you see. And, of course, this is the mystical experience. Uh, that And um, like Adorank uses the term unio mystica, the mystical union. Um, and we have these experiences of wanting, of breakthrough, uh, where you feel one to the universe, you feel one with all things. And this can happen in the context of joy and celebration, but also in the context of suffering. Absolutely. I'll never forget years ago, um, I was giving a talk and afterwards this woman said, and I, I talked about how suffering too can be a mystical experience. And a woman came up to me and she said, my four-year-old son was dying. And when I realized we couldn't do anything about it, I just sat by his bed hour after hour holding his hand. And she said, never in my whole life before or since have I ever felt so in union with the universe, with history, uh, with God. And, um, you know, again, that's, that's a simple story, but it's absolutely radical. It's a deep story and, uh, and it's true that these wanting experiences can happen in many circumstances. Eckhart says, for a person who is awake, breakthrough does not happen once a year, once a month, once a week, or once a day, but many times every day. So wanting can happen many times. I'll tell you a little story today. I was, I was, um, oh, I was at my temporary working on a daily meditation, and I was quoting some juicy stuff from Aquinas about harmony. He likes to define beauty as harmony. Yes. And my dog came and said he had to go outside. So I, I went to the door here and opened it for my dog. And I just had this experience of harmony, putting him out there. The sun was shining and these birds were flying very near to us uh, in harmony. <laughs> and I just felt this tremendous union, this running with the great picture of nature. Here's a dog who, who being on four legs and not two, is much closer to the earth than you and I are. And, and he was just so happy to join Mother Earth again, that wanting. But in the context, all this other wanting is going on. The birds and the sun was shining and the blue sky. And I just had an experience of, of harmony and therefore wanting uh, right on the spot. <laughs> so it wasn't just a word, it was a taste. It was, and of course the word yeah. wisdom yeah. comes to the word for taste in Latin and in Hebrew. I'm so happy that you mentioned animals because, and suffering, because as you were talking, I was remembering one of the most intense um, experiences of prayer I've ever had. I had a cat whom I loved abandonedly, the brother of my present cat, who is now the empress of my life. And his name was Topaz. And he was a beautiful golden cat. And mm. He contracted cancer at the age of five, which was horribly too mm. long. Mm. And I took him to the vet and this beautiful, kind young man came out with him, slightly drugged and said, and looked into my eyes. He said, you can keep him for two months and he'll suffer, or you can summon up your courage. Mm. And let him go now. Mm. And I looked into Topaz's eyes and I prayed as I'd never prayed before, give me the guidance. And Topaz just radiated back to me in ways I can't describe, but no, true. I'm ready. I trust you. You gave me life. You give me death. Mm. So he melted into my chest and then I put him on the table and I started to stroke him before the needle went in. And then I remembered that Ramana Maharshi had given the cow who loved him liberation when she was dying. Her name was Lakshmi. If you go to his ashram, there's a shrine to her as a liberated being. <laughs> he 
she had followed him around devotedly and he'd adored her. And when she was dying, he put his hand on her, her third eye and mm. say, I liberate you. Mm. And she was liberated. Mm. And so when the needle went in, I found myself praying to Ramana and said to him, I'm not enlightened like you are, but I know that you will answer if I beg you at this moment to give my beloved liberation. Mm. And I swear upon my immortal soul that when I put my hand on Topaz's crown center, his whole body relaxed mm. and he took death in without terror. Mm. And he just breathed a few times. And it was one of the moments where I really connected with the absolute power born out of absolute suffering of real intense sincere prayer it is answered by love when your suffering has exposed you to the depths of your own love and well, that's very beautiful and thank you for sharing it very very beautiful it actually triggers an experience i had with my my dog tristan who was my spiritual director for 15 years and um I was at my typewriter one day, I think I was writing my Aquinas book, and I realized I'd put her out, him outdoors and he hadn't returned. So I went out to find him and he had collapsed on the lawn. And it was, a week, it was Friday, so it was a weekend. I couldn't take him to the regular vet. I took him to a different vet who didn't know him. And they said, well, he'll keep him for the, for the weekend. And, and so I went back on Monday morning and they said, this is serious. You should take them, him to your regular vet. So he went to my vet. And, and they said, well, uh, give us three hours and we'll pick him over and see uh, whether, you know, you should let him go or, or not. So I went home and I got the call uh, and the call said we, we, we should put him to death to make, you know, to just like your case, you know, so there wouldn't be any more suffering. And I said, okay, I'll be right down. If it took me 20 minutes to get there and I walked in the door of the vet, they said, um, your dog has died. And I was very, I remember saying, I really wanted to say goodbye and thank him. What is the meaning of this? And then the vet said, he said, uh, she said, you know, you and your dog must have had an amazing relationship. And I said, why? She said, because as soon as I hung up the phone, your dog died. He was waiting for your permission. And that made all the sense in the world because just down a very independent. He didn't need a human being to put him to death. He just wanted my permission to let him go. So uh, it's interesting that you and I are talking about our pets when we're talking about wanting, but that's for, these are, this is very real for a lot of people. Oh my and God. This is where a lot of human love is. The greatest initiation is, in my uh, life. I, the love of animals has been a revelation of what love is to me. I mean, human yeah. love is wonderful, but it's so mm. complicated by psychology and <laughs> drama and karma and trauma. But there seems something yeah. perfectly pure in the love of animals. And uh -huh. I feel that being with my animal is almost the deepest form of prayer that I know mm. because it's wordless love in action it's wordless prayer wordless. it's prayer with touch it's prayer with caress it's prayer with adoration mm -hmm. and yeah. i've been i yeah, actually words. When I lived with eric we made up 108 names for our cat at the time who was called <laughs> Paul, and they were all bottled <laughs> after the sanskrit names for the goddess and when we went okay. shopping we would say the 108 names in row to celebrate her existence, such as the madness of animal lovers. But I want well, some to of them. <laughs> I think. How do you pray? What is prayer for you at this moment of your life? What are the prayers that you cling to or love to say? If it's not too personal, I think it would be wonderful. We would all love to know. Well, um... <clears throat> I like the Psalms. I like to uh, pray the Psalms and of course the mystics. And um, I just love it when, you know, I'm glad that you're enjoying Julian and these sentences just jump out at you. Um, 
and and you know wrap themselves around your neck you know uh uh and they they confirm uh my own deepest experience so in a way i'm just always open to hearing um the word of god you know and by that i mean interact i mean we're talking now about animals as words of god you see that they're they're other christ who are speaking to us and and communicating with um with angels calling on the spirits calling on ancestors um recently a, a shaman told me that that some of my deceased friends and co-workers were coming to my birthday party yes that was celebrated the other day Jose, yes. and there they were and um so i just find that poets and musicians and mystics of all kinds are are speaking to us on the other side on a regular basis and the key is that we be listening it's that that listening heart and um and you know that's part of the lexia divina so i'm i'm blessed because my work is so easy to to see my work as as prayer the kind of work that i that i get to do in the world um and um but finding silence is very important to me and this is one reason i like to go into nature uh with with my dog and as you say animals are wordless most of the time and uh so uh, that and and just beauty wherever it's it presents itself now i do sometimes um chant mantras uh i make up mantras and i chant familiar mantras um and um i find that repetition of something which is it's like a beat also that it's a great way of kind of getting my mind out of problem solving and more into the, the centering process um but uh, uh i i try to stay fresh by um learning new new insights um the, it just recently i ran across a beautiful uh, teaching from simon vial or, or is reminded of it how she says you know that that um you have to begin with the universe you have to begin with the universe if, if you're going to deal with suffering Mm. And I just found that so affirming of really everything we've been talking about, of this wisdom passage of cosmology, um, that, um, that suffering will take you into the, into the universe itself. And um, I don't know, I, there's so many beautiful teachers over the centuries from all traditions that any one of them can trip me up <laughs> and, and can give me an insight that I can just play with all day long and you know aquinas says the nearest thing to contemplation is play the contemplation is playing with wisdom he says right and so that kind of play um feeds me and, and that's what uh, thomas merton says he says that sophia is a mother longing to play with her children huh. and mm -hmm. what i found is that short prayers mm -hmm. have for me the greatest impact i mm -hmm. john cassian in his famous book on prayer he said don't pray long prayers your mind will get involved with them find mm. short phrases that really thrill you and focus your whole being so mm. i spent 30 years collecting in special notebooks my favorite short prayers from all the traditions and i put them into the book that i wrote called like the flame which you so kindly champion mm. and i've drawn on that book Mm. all the 40 days 40 nights intense mm. short prayers from all of these traditions because what i found is this man and i wonder if this corresponds with your own experience i found that when you pray intensely and play with the wisdom the charge wisdom of a short prayer it takes you even more deeply into the silence in which you will hear what job called the hidden word Mm. The prayer acts as the opening of the door of your being mm. to the luminous silence, which then, if you just sit in it with the whole of you, 
will start speaking or singing to you and guiding you from your own unified depths. Mm -hmm. Is that an experience that you... Oh, definitely. And that's exactly what um, the Christian tradition calls contemplation, a distinct from meditation. Right. You know, from the East, they, they're looked at differently, but the West is pretty pretty straightforward about that. The meditation is thinking on things and getting to places, but then you get to this point of entering the silence, and then the silence speaks back to you. I remember when I was a novice, that would have been, I would have been about 19 years old, and we had a lot of meditation, at least an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon. But I remember once I found this one short statement in the scriptures that said, it was from the Hebrew Bible, it said, son, give me your heart. That was one short sentence. And I just dwelled on that sentence, I think for three weeks. You know, it's exactly what you're talking about, that you kind of swim in this, in this truth, in this insight, in this wisdom, and it talks to you. But I'll never forget that. I mean, that was a lot of years ago. <laughs> I'm 80 now. Uh, the sun gives me your heart. It was just, it just hit me. I was 19, and I, I wanted to explore just that, those five words. What does it mean? And it just took me places. Took me on a trip. The phrase that did it for me at exactly the same age oh. was a broken and a contrite heart. I will not despise. Hmm. For some reason, I must have had a broken, but probably not very contrite heart <laughs> at the time. And that phrase mm. revealed to me, as I meditated on it, just abyss after abyss of the mercy and the forgiveness mm. and the compassion. And was that line from the scriptures? Or what was that from? Yeah. Does it. Uh -huh. And I wanted, because our time is coming to an end, I wanted to read to you. You know that I'm working on Hadovich of Antwerp, the great 13th century mystic. Mm. And she wrote an extraordinary poem about the hidden word, just mm. this, what we're speaking of. Mm. And for her, prayer and contemplation and all rituals and all ways of approaching God were to help you get into the depths of the silence in which you'd be ready with your whole being to receive the word that mm -hmm. nothing but love could speak, mm -hmm. the divine word that could save you and guide you. And this is what she wrote. She wrote, and let me put on my glasses because of the mad changing light. I know you love this. Wait on the hidden word. Do not do anything from your own will, believing in your own wisdom, until love's silence has spoken. Others will not understand or think you crazy or lazy, but what do they know? Love knows all things, and you will know what to do and how to do it if only you fix your heart on love always and love alone. This is how true lovers live, patiently waiting, sometimes through long dark years for love to speak and then acting in great joy, boundless trust, giving their all. I am not speaking of what I read. I am speaking of what I know, what I have come to learn through many storms and bitter mistakes. Hmm. And for me, what you're presenting in your daily meditations and what I've carefully calibrated in this universal prayer journey to help all beings prepare for the birth of the divine human in them, symbolically on Easter. Both of our activities are about helping people to enter that quantum field of silent direct union from which love can speak its own hidden words to guide us and inspire us and encourage us and infuse us and guide us to our mission and in and embolden us on that mission. That's my experience of prayer. Does that ring true for you? 
Well, very definitely. That's a wonderful passage from Hedwig. Um, and it, it parallels the sentence from Julian that I just loved. Charged with the quality of reverence and loving awe, we turn ourselves with all our might toward the actions to which we are guided. To me, that's very parallel to what I just, just said. That action comes out of this encounter with the mystery, with the silent uh, word, and, and the divine presence uh, once you learn to listen deeply. But that word charge is so wonderful. I mean, it's 600 years before we knew about electrical charges, you know, but I just love that word, charged with the quality of reverence and loving awe, we turn ourselves with all our might toward good actions. And um, Hedrus just said something very parallel to that, you know, that out of this emptying and this listening, deep listening to silence and to mystery and to love, which is mystery, um, we're ready to go to move into action. And, and, and then it's like a circle. And then with the action, then there are times when we want to return to this contemplation, to this receiving. And, and so it's like a circle or a spiral that keeps expanding and keeps going. And that's how we, we get recharged <laughs> and uh, keep up the struggle with joy and good humor. Good humor, but you embody wonderfully. <laughs> and craziness. And craziness, yes. Yeah. And craziness too, because my God, we need more of that on the earth. <laughs> Talking right. about divine craziness, I met You're a champion. Uh, in the eighteen in the nineteen eighties, when I was a little boy, sort of, <laughs> and because I was young, I asked her really, you know, point blank kind of question, and she was. She was very pleased to answer it. I said, how the hell do you do it? And I remember saying that, how the hell do you get up every morning and go out into that ocean of boiling misery and collect the poor and the dead and bring them back and help them die? And she said, there is only one way you can do it. And it's prayer. And what I do is that in the early morning at about five, I get up and I sit in front of the host and I pray in the depths of my heart to Jesus. And all I'm asking is to be filled up. And then I go out into my day and I pour out what I've been filled up with. And I go to bed completely smashed and exhausted. <laughs> and I get up and do exactly the same thing the next day. <laughs> That is about the greatest instruction on the power of prayer that you could ever have from someone who not only prayed her life into being, but lived her life uh -huh. as prayer. Uh -huh. And I think it's so important to, to say to people tenderly that when they dive into your meditations and when they take this journey into prayer, it's not to leave the world, it's to be able to enter the world mm -hmm. with more power, more energy, more peace, more passion, more humor, more divine craziness than ever so that you can do God's work in your own unique way in this appalling time. Yes, to be charged, to be charged up, yep, yep. Thank you well, for charging me up, Matt. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> well, thank you that you for charging beautiful talk. thousands of people up. You and do I that. encourage everybody who's listening into my group to plunge into Matt's amazing meditations. They give me great joy and inspiration. And I hope that all of you who are listening from Matt's group will jump into this prayer journey and let it prepare you to be a midwife warrior of the birth in this time of the great death. Amen. Amen. Love you, Matt. Thank you 